Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon uh, with an open phone line so that you can call in if you want to bring up questions for discussion about the Bible or about Christianity, uh, objections that you might have to anything in the Bible or Christianity. We'll welcome those too. Uh, you can talk about them. We have an hour to do that, no commercial breaks. Uh, so we just talk to people pretty much the whole, the whole time. And we have a couple of lines open at the moment. If you want to call now, the number is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And uh, we have an announcement to make about the uh, day after tomorrow, Friday. Um, there's going to be a debate between myself and a, a gentleman who is a dispensationalist about I guess a number of dispensational points. Uh, they approached me. Uh, you know, I would have I would have made it a more narrow debate, not just about a whole bunch of dispensational points, but one. But I do what I'm told usually. I mean, if, if I'm invited, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, so anyway, that's coming up this Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. It's on YouTube, so you can watch it anywhere in the world. Although it won't be 5 p.m. everywhere uh, when it's live broadcast. So. If you're interested, you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, thenarrowpath.com, under announcements, you'll find the uh, login link there to the YouTube uh, live stream. Now, a week later, a little, uh, like eight days later, I'm going to be debating our friend Max, the atheist, and uh, information about logging onto that will be available too, because that's going to also be an online debate. Um, so, those things are coming up this Friday and the following Saturday, a week later. <clears throat> All right, let's talk to Dustin calling from Fort Worth, Texas. Dustin, welcome. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Um, I, if you had asked me 20 minutes ago to defend the idea of eternal conscious torment or annihilationism or conditional immortality, uh, I would have said one thing. I would have, I would have pointed to Philippians 3, uh, 19, is it? The, their end is destruction. Um, and I would have said, hey, it sounds like the end of a wicked person is that they are destroyed, they're dispensed of, and then they no longer exist. And so I, I suspect that you probably wrote about this in your book, but I hadn't read your book. I'm sorry. So my question is this. I saw that just 20 minutes ago that the same word for destruction used there in Philippians is used in Revelation. Excuse me? It could be in ruin. Yeah, but go ahead. Well, it's used in Revelation seventeen eight and seventeen eleven, talking about the beast. That the beast goes to destruction, but then we also see in I think Revelation twenty that the mm -hmm. beast is tormented day and night forever and ever. Yeah. So that's the first time I've ever seen a connection between destruction and something that is said to be continuous. Well, the uh, I just wanted your thoughts on it. Yeah. As I say, uh, no matter which view of hell you take, you'll find, uh, and no matter which scripture you use to defend the view that you take, you'll find that the other two views have a way of looking at that same scripture. That's what makes it frustrating. That's what makes it really quite difficult, if not impossible, for me to make a final decision about it. Because you can take the whole scriptural case for one view, and each of the other two views can use those scriptures. Uh, they might find them a little inconvenient, but they can they can use them. They can accommodate them. And it doesn't matter which view you take. The other two can handle all those scriptures. It's just really that ambiguous. But yeah, what, there's a lot of uh, a lot of times the annihilationist or the conditional immortality view will bring up scriptures about you know the wicked will be destroyed, uh, the wicked will perish, which is the same word in the Greek usually is being destroyed. And uh, and so they say, see that means. 
that, that means that they are uh, annihilated. But the people who believe in eternal conscious torment, the traditional view, they would point out that the word destroyed is used sometimes to speak of something being ruined, not annihilated. Uh, for example, when Jesus said that you don't want to put new wine into old wineskins, or the wineskins will burst, and, and they're ruined. Well, they don't, they don't cease to exist, they're just ruined. You, you know, they're not useful anymore. And, and they would say that you know, if you bring a wrecking ball uh, to demolish a house, uh, you haven't annihilated it because all the components are still there in the physical world, but they're, it's ruined. It's a ruined house. In fact, it might even be that a totaled car might have relatively little damage, but it's ruined enough that you, you can't really fix it. So uh, they would say, that, that is the traditional view about eternal conscious torment, would say, well, all these references to ruin, they are, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily, destroyed could mean ruined, and therefore it doesn't mean that they can't uh, that they can't be tormented forever. They're just ruined for for eternity. Um, now that's that's how the way the traditional view would take it. The uh, universalist people might say, well, whenever the Bible talks about people being ruined, it is almost never talk, or I should say, destroyed, which is also can mean that. Uh, when it talks about people being destroyed, it it many times, perhaps most of the time, is not referring to what happens to them in hell. It's talking about what's going to happen to them. In this world, uh, especially in the Old Testament, when nations are destroyed and so forth, it's not talking about the afterlife. It's talking about judgment coming upon them in this life. And in the New Testament, uh, there's this looming portent of the impending judgment on Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And, you know, the word destruction is used a lot of times for it. But it's not talking about what happens in hell. It's talking about what happens in history. So, you know, we have... Sometimes we have to be careful when we say, well, we got a lot of verses that say that the uh, wages of sin is death and that people will be destroyed and perish and so forth. Uh, but it's not always clear whether that's talking about in this life, like they'll come to an awful end in this life, or whether it's talking about what happens after the judgment when they're thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, that's the problem. You see, it, it, for someone to say, well, I have this verse that says such and such, and that proves that the, the correct view of hell is this. I'll just say that the people who hold the other two views, no, no matter which view you're supporting, who, the other two views uh, can accommodate that verse. And, which means it's almost impossible. For me, I have so, thus far, I have found it impossible to really settle on one view over the others because, well, because I've become familiar with the scriptural case for all of them. And so... Yeah, I understand. There's, you know, uh, there's a lot of passages about destruction, to be sure. But um, whether it's talking about destruction in this world, or whether it's destruction like annihilation after they're thrown into the lake of fire, or whether destruction doesn't mean annihilation at all, it just means they're they're ruined for eternity, but they're tormented for eternity. Those are the various ways that whole that whole thought can be taken. I, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here. Oh, it's, it's, I've listened to you for a while, and it sounds like you favor uh, a conditional immortality view. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, I may be wrong. You say right now that you don't, you, you're unable to decide. Do you, are you familiar with the annihilationist or view of how, like, what would an, uh, an annihilationist uh, say to the idea that destruction is used of the beast but the beast is tormented forever you know what the right come back well, or the right. not the come back but the uh, all right okay. first of all first of all to say that the the beast and the false prophet and the dragon are tormented forever and ever day and night as it says in revelation chapter 20 verse uh, i think it's verse 10 um the, uh, some would say well, first of all, the dragon is not a person, it's the devil. And the beast and the false prophet are not individuals either. This is referring to systems. Anti-God governmental systems, anti-God uh, religious systems that are personified for the sake of the story. And therefore, it's not really talking about literal persons, but institutions being destroyed. And they're being tormented day and night is simply a way of... Uh, you know, the, the story is told in hyperbole. It's like, it's like at the end of a fairy tale... When you say they lived happily ever after. 
well, you mean you, you mean the couple never died? You know, they lived and were happy every single day. And, you know, that's simply a, a hyperbole to say it all ended well for them, and uh, to say these these uh, entities are thrown in the lake of fire. They're tortured forever and ever. Well, we have to look a few verses later in verse fourteen. It talks about how death and Hades, who also were personified in the book of Revelation. Earlier in chapter 6, death was riding a horse and Hades was following after it. Neither death nor Hades are persons or conscious beings at all. Uh, they are, you know, places or concepts or something. And they, they're thrown into the lake of fire too. So, I mean, in the lake of fire, uh, the, the passage in Revelation 20, like the rest of Revelation, highly symbolic. And, uh, and so some might say, well, you know, it's a very symbolic way of saying all the bad guys come to a, uh, the, the worst conceivable end and uh, and the good guys live happily ever after kind of a thing. Um, so that's that's one way it would take it. Some would say, well, the beast and the false prophet might indeed and the devil be tormented day and night forever and ever, but they're not the or they're not ordinary people. Some people believe the beast is a person, but they believe he's a specially incarnate, incarnate of, of Satan, you know, and the and the false prophet perhaps know better. It doesn't say that everybody who's thrown into the lake of fire exists forever and ever. And, and you know, it says they're tormented day and night forever and ever in the passage. There's no day or night in hell right. or even in the new earth, even in the new Jerusalem. There's no day or night. You know, the day and night were created for this earth in, you know, the, the first day of creation. And uh, so when it says they're tormented day and night, it certainly gives the impression that this is a poetic way of talking about uh, continuous, you know, you know, the continuous end uh, to them. But again, the torment of them. Remember, we're talking about, in, in some cases, at least in the case of death and Hades, we're not talking about personal entities. We're talking about concepts and things like that that were personified in the symbolism of the story. And at the end of the story, they get the wicked end that they all deserve. And you know, to use hyperbole like that is not not the least bit unthinkable in uh, prophecy or in apocalyptic language. So, you know, uh, some would say, uh, some would say, yeah, there is a literal eternal torment for the beast and the false prophet and the devil, but not for everybody, because those aren't ordinary people. Um, others would say uh, the whole idea of the eternal torment of these um, beings is simply a, a poetic or, a, you know, a symbolic hyperbole that's suited very much to the symbolism of the, the story itself throughout the book. So, I mean, that's how some people take it. Oh, awesome. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for your call. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, Michael from Inglewood, California. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. <clears throat> yes, Steve. I wanted to say thanks for something you said yesterday. Um, it helped me, especially today being Valentine's Day. <clears throat> I, th I believe you mentioned... You were divorced for about 10 years, and then um, it was kind of a struggle. Um, celibacy was kind of a struggle. So to hear, you know, a holy man of old say that is really encouraging, and I'd like to say thanks for that. But uh, my okay. question... I, I should uh -huh. clarify. When I said celibacy was a struggle, I didn't mean that I was a failure at that struggle. I was saying I, I understand how difficult it is to be single and celibate because yeah. I, you know, I didn't find it easy. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, correct. So my question, though, is from your book where uh, you state that Jesus is in heaven, and then after he returns, I guess the second advent, it doesn't say that, but I think that's what you mean, um, he will never live in heaven anymore. And I was just wondering if that's found in the Bible. Well, the Bible indicates that Jesus is going to reign forever uh, from sea to sea. On the earth, the earth is man's domain, and Jesus became the Son of Man to become part of the human race and to redeem what man had lost. And so, uh, I mean, when God, when God made Adam and even put him on earth, the intention was for them to live there forever. It was only interrupted because they sinned, and then, of course, the whole history of God's redemption, which has been the story of the whole of history since then, uh, had to take place. But uh, God never really made heaven as a place for people he made he made the earth for people and people for the earth and uh, uh we have no record anywhere of him ever changing his plan it says in psalm 115 and verse 16 the heaven even the heavens are the lord's 
but the earth he has made for the sons of men. So, you know, or he's given to the sons of men, it says. So we have then, uh, you know, a statement that man is made for earth. Uh, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 about Adam, it says the first man was of the earth and earthy. You know, he's made of earth and uh, he belongs to the earth. In fact, uh, when, he, when he sinned, God said to him, well, you, you are dust and you're going to go back to dust, you know. Now, uh, I believe that because of what Christ has accomplished, those who are saved, when they die, and they do, in fact, go back to dust, their spirits go to be with the Lord in heaven until such a time as Jesus returns. And then he's going to raise the dead. This, this is simply, you know, the biblical eschatology as it's been taught for 2,000 years. There's never been, a, never been a significant teacher in the church, as far as I know, whoever, whoever indicated that Jesus is not going to come back and uh, not going to raise the dead. But many people thought, well, why raise the dead? If, if when we die, we go to be with the Lord, our spirits go to be with the Lord, and our bodies go in the ground and decay, why bother raising the dead if we're already in heaven? Well, because heaven isn't where we're going to live forever. God never intended for people to live forever in heaven. In fact, Jesus isn't going to live forever in heaven. Why should he? Uh, he's coming here. He's coming to claim his domain and, re and reign here among us uh, in the perfect, renewed world, the very world he created for Adam and Eve, uh, and intended for them to live forever in if they hadn't sinned. So that's how I understand it. I don't, I don't know of anything in the Bible that gives any other idea. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says anyone other than God or, or angels would live in heaven for, forever. In fact, there are some people, I don't, I'm not one of them, but there are some people who say that the Bible doesn't ever say that people are going to heaven. They, they would say that uh, you know, when you die, you don't go to heaven. You just go into a state of slumber. And then you rise on the last day when Jesus comes back. But then there wouldn't really be any time when we go to heaven. But I do believe that the Christian goes to heaven when, when he or she dies. And then, you know, we come back and inhabit our raised bodies to live on the new earth when Jesus comes back. That strikes me as, you know, as, you know just the whole, the whole scheme of things from Genesis to Revelation. In Revelation, the last thing we see is the people of God living in the new Jerusalem, which is on the new earth. We know it's not in heaven because when he sees it, it's coming down. He sees a new heaven and new earth. And then he sees a new Jerusalem descending from heaven. Well, to where? Clearly to earth. That's the only other place besides heaven. So um, the new Jerusalem is on earth. And, uh, and, but it's a renewed earth where there's no more curse, no more death, no more sickness, no more sorrow. Uh, that's what it says in Revelation chapter 21. And that's what I believe. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thanks for your encouragement. All right, Michael. God bless you. Good to hear from you. Uh, Al from Kansas City. Hi, Al. Welcome. Yeah, hi. I enjoy your show a lot. Um, I have a question about the Christian faith. Um, okay. I was wondering how a Christian could justify or um, would it be wrong for a Christian to... Um, support and follow a person that was like uh, did adultery and was convicted of civically uh, sexual assault and a consistent liar and moral scams people out of money pretty much an evil person a prideful person right and a leader of a cult and uh, pretty much a party he belongs to the people are pretty much uh as sinful as he is, seems like. So are you talking about? Are you talking about? You, are you talking about Mormonism? Oh no, no, no! I'm oh, talking okay. about a certain person uh, that um, who, who I hope and pray you would not follow or support uh, in the political uh, uh, realm. Well, uh, no Christians don't follow political leaders; they follow Jesus. Okay, but. You would, it wouldn't be wrong for a Christian uh, to vote for Trump. Is the, is the bottom well, line. Voting, yeah, voting, voting for a person is, has nothing to do with following a person. When you follow somebody, it means you're you're their disciple. You're learning from them. You're you're imitating them. You're you're letting them give instructions to you. That's what that's what being a follower of Jesus means, and that's what a Christian is. A Christian is a follower of Jesus. Now, when you vote for a candidate. Uh, none of those things are, are implied about that. Voting for a candidate means that you have a choice between two people who will be uh, making the policies for your country, 
for the next four years, and you prefer the policies that that person's going to make over the policies the other one's going to make. So, I mean, that's that's what voting is. Voting has nothing to do with following a person. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't see why a Christian couldn't vote for a candidate who is maybe a, maybe a scumbag in real life, but his policies are the ones that you would like to have, uh, you know, be the policies of your country, as opposed to the alternative. Uh, for example, I think many people would vote for Trump for no, no better reason than, than that the alternative, uh, whoever it is on the other side, we don't know who that's going to be at this point, but we know that the Democratic Party, for example, and I'm not a Republican, by the way, I'm, I'm independent, so I'm not... I'm not a shill for the for Trump or for the De uh, Republican Party at all, but uh, the Democratic Party has stood for the murder of babies. For uh, you know, there hasn't been a, a leading Democratic politician that hasn't uh, favored the murder of babies uh, for for many many elections now. Now, some Christians would say that alone is a good reason to hope that the Democrats don't don't prevail, and you know, we might have in a Republican alternative. Somebody who, you know, is is a person we don't don't care much for, but caring for somebody is not what it's about. You know, a lot of people have said, you know, they they wouldn't like to uh, when when DeSantis was a was an option in the Republican Party. A lot of people said, well, he's not the kind of guy you'd like to sit and have a beer with. Well, I don't want. I'm not going to vote for somebody you know who I can sit down and have a beer with. I'm going to vote for someone who knows how to govern and can get things done and has good ideas that are good for the country. That's that's who I would vote for, and um, so I, I don't care who that is. Uh, but but to say you would vote for somebody because their policies are going to be better for the country and better for next generation. By the way, Christians should be concerned about the well-being of the next generation. The Bible does say we're supposed to do to others what we would want done to us. If we're glad that some previous generations gave us some freedoms and some uh, you know some values and some you know, uh, security, you know, and that, that kind of thing. Um, and, and we appreciate having those things. Then it'd be, it'd be very sinful for us to, to not try to pass those things on to the next generations. And uh, so, I mean, if one candidate's going to take those things away and leave, leave the country impoverished and, and without freedoms and, and, and babies without any protection uh, about, against being murdered um, by doctors and by their mothers, um, then I'd say, you know, uh, a Christian would have very good reasons to vote uh, for whoever would keep those people out of office. Uh, by the way, a Christian might not be very happy that Mr. Trump would be the candidate on the other side. But again, uh, this is not a personality cult. I, I, I think there probably is a Trump personality cult, but I don't think Christians are in it. Um, there are people who are, you know, big time you know, the fan club of President Trump. But, uh, but whether, whether you're that way or not, I mean, when you vote, you should be sober. And you should say, okay, th if this person comes to office, these are going to be the consequences for the next generation. This is the kind of America that American babies are going to be born into and have to live in. Uh, now, on, on the other hand, if this other person is voted in, the policies he makes, and by the way, in this case, Trump, we know what kind of policies he makes. He's, we've had four years of him, and, and frankly, it was quite good for the country. We've also had four years of the Democrats, and it wasn't very good for the country. So I mean, that's that's why probably many Christians do vote for Trump, not because they're fans, but because they care about their children and grandchildren. Uh, I'm an independent, too, but I, uh, Trump was for abortion until uh, he could see where... Uh, it would help him to be against it. I don't True. believe Trump. True. Trump I mean, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, not, the other. I'm no, I didn't say he cares. I said, what policies will he make? I don't care what yeah. he cares about. Well, I care about what he's he, going to do. Well, many Christians, I don't know if you've ever seen after a rally, they interview people and they all say they're Christian. They think that uh, Christ has anointed him to be the president. And even uh, Mike Johnson wants to uh, have a test for uh, to be a Christian to be a Christian nation. Well, we and, can't have that. Uh, we, we can't have that. The Constitution does not allow that. The Constitution does not allow, allow us to have a religious test for a candidate. So that simply is out of the question. It might be nice. Christians might think it'd be nice to have uh, in office people who who believe in God and believe in Christ and who fear God and want to do what's right in the sight of God. 
Yeah, I, I wish everyone in office had at least that going for them. That doesn't make them Christians, but it sure would make a better country uh, than we have now. But uh, you know, more amazing to me is that there are Christians who think that it's okay to vote for you know, those who want to kill babies. Now, I don't know if Trump wants to kill babies, but I know that, like you said, when he realized that the, what side of the, butter, the bread the butter was on, he came out you know, and, and put in some Supreme Court justices that were uh, not as likely to kill babies. And that's a good thing. I don't care what he prefers in his private life. He, <laughs> you, you vote for a, a candidate be, to do something publicly. What he does privately, you might wish he'd live a good life privately. And as, as far as I know, Trump may be living a good life. I don't know. I know he's done many things I don't think Christians would ever approve of in his past. I'm not sure what he's doing now, and it's not my first concern. Uh, I'd love it if it turned out that he was living like a godly Christian. But if he's not, that's not what you vote. You don't vote for a, a, a president to be the elder or pastor of your church. He's, it's a secular position where he's going to be making law, not laws, but policies and so forth that are, uh, are going to affect generations to come. So that's why some Christians prefer Trump. Uh, and, and many Christians will vote for him holding their nose because they don't really like him, but they, but they like what he's going to do more than what his adversaries will do. So, I mean, that's, that would be the answer to your question, I think. Hey, we need to take a break. We have another half hour coming up, so don't go away. The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California. 92593 or go to our website thenarrowpath.com I'll be back in 30 seconds The Narrow Path is on the air due to the generous donations of appreciative listeners like you we pay the radio stations to purchase the time to allow audiences around the nation and around the world by way of internet to hear and participate in the program all contributions are used to purchase such airtime. No one associated with the narrow path is paid for their service. Thank you for your continued support. Back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour, taking your calls. If you'd like to call in with questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, or you'd like to call in to challenge the Bible or the Christian faith on any point, we'll be glad to talk to you. The number is 844-484-5737. I can save you time by saying the lines are full right now, so don't call right now. But if you call and say five, ten minutes, or any time in the remaining part of the half hour, if we have time, we'll get to you. Their lines are opening up all the time. So that's number is 844-484-5737. Our next caller is Ray calling from Toledo, Ohio. Ray, welcome. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Good. Um, I had a question. It's kind of a two-part question. One of it is about Genesis 128. And this is where they talk about... Uh, Replenish. What does he mean by replenish the earth if there was no life on earth before Adam and yeah. Eve? Well, it does say that God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And in the King James Version, it says, and replenish the earth, which would suggest refill the earth, supposing that, you know, it would give the impression there were, there were, you know, there was a population before this. However, the word replenish in the King James Version is not found in any of the other translations, including the New King James, as far as I know, um, and it, it, the, the Hebrew word is simply translated to fill the earth. So it's a little, the King James was a little confusing in using the English word replenish to, to uh, translate this particular Hebrew word. Virtually all Hebrew scholars who make the newer translations just render it as fill the earth, which does not suggest there was a previous population. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and I was also going to ask you, I'm learning... For the last couple of years off and on, I've been watching the rooted word, and he's going verse by verse from the earliest manuscripts he can get a hold of for the Septuagint. And I was wondering, you had mentioned that before on your show, 
or on somewhere, I can't remember, I've listened to you a lot, but um, you were mentioning you were also um, learning it as you were going, the Septuagint too, and has that influenced any of your beliefs, um, seeing differences between the King James or other modern day Bibles as to the true meanings of the Septuagint manuscripts? Well, the, the, the differences would be between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and that translation was made about 285 years before the time of Christ by a group of Jewish scholars, traditionally 70 scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, translated the whole of the uh, Hebrew text of the Old Testament into Greek, because Greek was now the language everyone spoke and Hebrew was not. So it's sort of like someone making an English translation for English readers or, or a modern English translation for modern English readers. But uh, translators don't always do a perfect job. And you do find there are some differences in some passages. The wording is different uh, on a few verses, some verses in the Old Testament. If you're looking at the Septuagint, which is in the Greek, or if you're looking at the... Uh, you know, the Masoretic text or even the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Hebrew. Um, the differences, fortunately, are not significant enough to matter much. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, <coughs> important doctrines held by Christians or Jews that, that uh, would be altered by any of these differences. There's obviously some verses that are worded differently. There is some question as to in the cases when the Septuagint reads one way and the Hebrew text another way, which one really reflects the original better. Now we might say, well, the Hebrew would because it was written in Hebrew before it was translated into Greek. But unfortunately, the Hebrew manuscripts we have are, they don't go further back than about the first century um, AD, whereas the Septuagint was translated almost three centuries earlier. Now, of course, we don't have copies of the Septuagint that go back that far either, but the, the issue is that did, did the translators who translated the Septuagint, uh, did they have Hebrew manuscripts that they very accurately translated, uh, which are older and better than the ones we have in Hebrew? We don't know. They, they definitely had earlier manuscripts than we have. And uh, so if they're different from our Hebrew manuscripts, is that a defect in their translating? Or is it that our Hebrew manuscripts have been altered by copying in the time since that time? And that this, the Septuagint actually preserves uh, a better reading from an older set of Hebrew manuscripts? I, I don't think we can really answer that because we don't have older manuscripts. If, if we find Hebrew manuscripts that are as old as, let's say, 300 BC, which is before the Septuagint was made, then, um, then we would know the answer to that. And maybe we will, but finding the Dead Sea Scrolls, which go back to the first century A.D., or maybe first century B.C., some would say, um, you know, that was an incredible find, to find actual manuscripts that are 2,000 years old. But uh, the, the likelihood that we'll find older ones uh, and be able to then compare them with the Septuagint uh, doesn't seem very likely, but it's very possible. In the meantime, there is still some question about some verses, the, the precise wording of some verses. But as I said, no important doctrine that I know of has ever been uh, threatened by the uncertainty about the reading of an Old Testament passage based on comparison of the Septuagint with the Hebrew text. Thanks a lot. That cleared up a lot. I didn't know that about the Hebrew text and... Uh um, that's, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay, Ray. Good talk to you, brother. God bless. All right, let's talk to Joseph from Irvine, California. Joseph, welcome. Hi, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I was wondering about uh, King Solomon. Would you say that Solomon uh, might have been or was an apostate, at least towards the end of his life? Well, he did go bad. Yeah, I mean, he definitely... Yeah. He definitely rebelled uh, against God, and we know that because he tried to kill, I mean, a prophet told him that his kingdom was going to be taken from him and ten tribes be given to Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam was the foreman on the building project of the temple at the time, and when Solomon heard that, 
he tried to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam had to flee to Egypt to, to escape that. So here, a prophet of God told Solomon that God was going to take the kingdom from him and, and give it to this guy, and to try to prevent that from happening, Solomon you know, tried to kill the guy. So obviously, it's, it's evident that Solomon was not, his heart was not right toward God at that time. Uh, it does say in chapter 11 of 1 Kings, King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, and the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor will they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. And, of course, uh, they did turn his heart away from God. And um, it says in verse 6, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as his father David did. So, yeah, Solomon went, went uh, afoul. Now, if one would ask, did he die in that state or did he come back to, to faith before he died? I'm going to uh, I'm going to suggest that I think he came back, and I base that on the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes we know was written uh, by a very old man. He 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 describes his old age in chapter twelve. He speaks to young men and says, "You know, serve God in your youth uh, before you get old, like me." And and uh, you know, and uh, in that last chapter of Ecclesiastes which I believe was written, I mean, Solomon had defected earlier in life, and then later in life he wrote Ecclesiastes. It sounds like he was back on the right track, because at the very end of Ecclesiastes, he says, uh, let's hear the conclusion of the matter. Uh, fear God and uh, keep his commandments, for this is man's whole duty. Uh, for he'll be a judge, he'll judge every work, you know, whether it be good or bad. So, the very closing words of Ecclesiastes suggest that Solomon had uh, learned his lesson. Now, I suppose one could argue, well, he had irreparably fallen away and couldn't repent, but he's warning young men not to make the mistakes he made. But uh, I'm, I'm going to take a more optimistic view and suggest that it looks like he came to his senses before he died. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think of it. I just... Um Back when I wasn't really sure and I kind of leaned more towards uh, once saved, always saved, mm -hmm. it was kind of the story of Solomon that made me start to question it because I'm like, this guy was clearly walking with God at the beginning. You know, God was right. like, talking to him directly and everything, and then he just completely turned away. So, um, um, yeah. yeah, and I was going to ask you about Ecclesiastes because that's a really interesting book for me because if is. he was an apostate when he wrote some of his stuff, like, how can we trust it? Because a lot of the stuff in Ecclesiastes, you wouldn't be like following some of the instructions, you got to read the whole thing to get the context right. It's not well, you're right. Advice. You're right, because yeah, a lot of the advice in Ecclesiastes is not good advice. And yeah. uh, much of it, he says, I mean, he talks about the time when he had wandered away from God and he was seeking man's highest good under the sun, meaning apart from God. And uh, mm -hmm. he talks about his, his uh, investigation into many things, seeking man's highest good really and he he did it through pleasure and through women and through you know, parties and uh through agriculture and through music and through uh, he all kinds of things and throughout the whole book he says i tried this and i tried that and i tried that and he says and i found that it was all emptiness it was vanity it's like striving after the wind he said and uh, so uh it it looks like you know when he gives bad advice sounds like he's saying this is the advice I gave to people back then or these are the conclusions I reached for example uh, Seventh-day Adventists and others who believe in soul sleep they like to uh, they like to quote from Ecclesiastes 9 where he said the dead know nothing at all you know uh, in other words they don't know anything when you die you don't know anything so people who believe in soul sleep like to use that as a proof text but you better be careful with Ecclesiastes that that particular chapter 9 begins with the word words, I considered all this in my heart. And I was, back then, I thought this way, you know, and he's sort of like, it'd be a little bit like if you hear someone give their testimony, they got saved out of Hinduism, and they said, yeah, back when I was a Hindu, I, you know, I reasoned that, you know, karma, uh, you know, if you have good karma, you'll be reincarnated in a better way, and if you have bad karma, you'll be reincarnated in a bad way. 
But that doesn't mean that saying, I thought this way at the time, means, and I'm here to affirm these things. Rather, many times people tell their testimonies and say how mistaken they were about things. And I think that's probably what's going on in Ecclesiastes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, there's actually one little portion of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I had a question about if I can ask it or I can just leave. Go ahead. Give me Go a ahead. Okay, um, there's that one part where he says, uh, I forget which verse, but he says, um, God made man upright, but... Uh, I have man made many devices. Various schemes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, like, to me, that I believe that, and I thought that's a pretty good, like, um, with, with uh, I guess, arguing against original sin kind of stuff, where it's like mm -hmm. God doesn't make you, you know, deficient. Um, but then I was like, well, it's Ecclesiastes, so I don't know if it's yeah. a good, uh, yeah. you know, so you have well, any thoughts might, about that? Is he correct yeah. in that? There might be other biblical basis for questioning original sin, but I wouldn't place much sure. weight on that statement in Ecclesiastes, partly because, as I said, Ecclesiastes isn't really where you go for doctrine. It's yeah. the testimony of a guy who was backslidden during most of the time he's describing. But also, that statement could be referring to God made man in the Garden of Eden upright, mm. but that man has, has gone and done many schemes. So, in other words... When he says God made man upright, uh, it may not necessarily be saying that every person has been born upright, but rather mankind. Okay. The first, the first man was upright. So I, I wouldn't want to lean on that that verse to to make that point. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't want to just see what I want to see. Okay, <laughs> I appreciate your perspective. Pleasure Thanks, to talk to you. Great talking to you. All right, Sergio from Maricopa, Arizona, who where I was the other night, and I met Sergio again. I met him over a year ago, too. Hi, Sergio. Hey, Steve. Thank you for taking my call. They appreciate yeah. your answers. Um, my question is, Muslims bring up that Paul gave a sacrifice in the temple in Acts 26 because of a vow, and it looks mm -hmm. like that Paul did it to show affinity to the, to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Paul was only able to do that while the temple was still intact? Um, just trying to think about like Hebrew roots, cults, or those that are trying to mix um, Judaism with Christianity. So yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying. To, I'm coming from that point of view. Well, first of all, uh, Paul was not Torah observant. He said in First Corinthians nine that when he is with those who are under the law, he behaves like one under the law and complies with their expectations so that he might win those who are under the law. But he says, when I'm with those who are not under the law, meaning Gentiles who don't do those things, he says, I live as one who's not under the law. So I could reach those people who are not under the law. Now he says, sometimes, I, sometimes I'm Torah observant, sometimes I'm not. But I, uh, my choice in the matter is based on what I think is most likely to be uh, least offensive to those people I'm trying to reach. If, uh, if my eating pork in the presence of Jews is going to offend them, well, then, uh, then I won't do it in their presence. But if I'm served pork at a Gentile's house, I'll eat it. Now, anyone who takes that approach obviously does not believe that it's mandatory to be Torah observant because a, a true Torah observant person would not eat pork no matter who, what company he's with. You know, so it seems clear that he is not a Torah observant Jew, but on occasion, he said, when he's trying to, to, to keep the peace with Jewish people, uh, he doesn't flagrantly violate the Torah in presence. And, and so when he came to um, Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, and James, or excuse me, 21, and James said to him, uh, you know, you see here, brethren, we, we, Paul, we have many brethren here who are zealous for the law and they're they're suspicious of you that you're undermining the law so to show that you're not undermining their their keeping of the law we'd like to for you to you know participate in the paying the fees of these four men with the nazarite and go to the temple and do this which paul did and this is very typical of his policy he said when i'm with those under the law i i, I comply I, I behave because there's nothing about the law that commands us to do anything that a Christian can't do. In other words, uh, a Christian can eat unclean foods, for example. Uh, the, the law does not allow this, but a, a, a Christian can restrict his diet 
to include only unclean foods, if that's going to keep him on good terms with Jews who would be offended otherwise. So he, he's got more, the one who has the most liberty is the one who can make the sacrifice for the person who, who doesn't have that liberty. But in doing so, see, Paul didn't like the idea that the Galatians were getting circumcised and keeping festivals. In other words, there were people influencing the Galatian Christians to become Torah observant. And Paul said he didn't tolerate that at all. He said that they're giving up their faith in Christ to do that. But see, they were Gentiles. Paul made it very clear, first of all, Gentiles are not Jews. And, and therefore, there's not the least reason for them to keep the, the law that was given only to, to Israel. Now, the Jewish Christians, and I believe that Paul felt, since he was a Jewish Christian, and he didn't feel he had to keep the law, I believe he felt that the, the Torah observance of the Jews was unnecessary. But I don't think he thought it was evil for Jews to do that. I mean, these, these Christians in Jerusalem... You know, they they were Torah observant all their lives. They were circumcised as babies. They kept they made the they went to the temple on the regular temple occasions, and there was nothing evil about going to the temple. It's you know you're not you're not doing something immoral by going there. But he wouldn't let Gentiles even do that much because that would be too much of a uh, an accommodation to those people who thought that Gentiles have to become Jewish. But but he didn't you know he didn't Paul didn't didn't mind Jews being Jewish. Uh, even if they're Jewish Christians. So when Paul came to Jerusalem, he did try to fit in. But that's very much in keeping with his policy that he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 9. And that those verses in 1 Corinthians 9 are verses 20, and, uh, 20 through 22 it is. So uh, that's what I think. Now, of course, when the temple was destroyed, nobody kept the law. You can't keep the law without a temple. Uh, the Torah is mostly about offering animal sacrifices in the temple. There's, there's other things in the Torah. There's 613 laws. Most of them have to do with temple observance. And once the temple was destroyed, it was impossible to keep Torah. I mean, Jews who rejected Jesus and their temple was taken from them, they, they got together and came up with what we call Talmudism or Rabbinism. The rabbis came up with rules for Jews to keep that were different from what the law said. Uh, and they called that Judaism. So ever since 70 AD, when the temple is destroyed, Judaism isn't what the Bible teaches. It's not what Moses taught. I mean, it certainly over, overlaps it. But Moses taught animal sacrifices, and no Jew has offered animal sacrifices for the past 2,000 years, roughly. And so, no, Paul wouldn't be keeping the Torah because no one would be keeping the Torah after 70 A.D. But Paul didn't live that long anyway. He died before 70 A.D. Awesome. Thank you for... Okay, sir, Joe. Good talk to you, man. God bless. Junior from Virginia, I'm glad you called earlier today than yesterday. We got a little more time. Go ahead. Yes, I'm going to save the question for yesterday for another time, um, okay. although it is a good uh, question, but I have a more curious um, question. Um, so... This question is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Yeah. Um, and he, I believe, asked his disciples to pray with them. So um, my wife asked the question in a Bible study, and I am also curious about this as well. One, um, why, I guess, if Jesus was there, um, why did he ask them to pray? The second question was, what was the topic of prayer? Was it more... Um, was there like a prayer request or was it a prayer for something specific? I, I don't know. I just, um, maybe uh, you have an answer yeah. for that. And, um, I think that's it for the most part. I forgot the third part, but yeah, that's, that's my question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. Well, when Jesus told them to, uh, pray, he specifically says, watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. So, in other words, they were to pray for their own spiritual survival in the test that he knew was coming up. That's uh, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So, he, you know, he, he didn't tell them to pray that he'd be delivered from arrest since they didn't actually at that point realize he was going to be arrested that night. Uh, I mean, that was what he was praying about. He was saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me but not my will, but yours be done. That's his prayer. But the disciples weren't praying about that particular thing because they didn't know about that danger. But 
he did say just watch and pray, meaning the word watch means stay awake and pray uh, for an hour. And they couldn't do that and didn't do that, but they didn't realize they were in a crisis either. But he said, you know, pray that you will not uh, fall into temptation. It's a little bit like what he, when he told the disciples to pray in general in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's, uh, that's kind of the subject matter of, that he wanted them praying about. And they may well, uh, the Bible says they were very tired, and that's why they fell asleep. But perhaps it would have been, they might have exerted more effort if they had really understood the, the, the test that was coming with that very night, you know, in the garden, that they were all going to be tempted to flee, and, and, and they did. Uh, you know, they all abandoned Jesus. So they didn't pray for an hour with him <laughs> about that, and, and they didn't escape the temptation. So yeah. that, that was what they were yeah. to pray about. That's a fair answer. That's a, that's a good answer. Thank you. And since I may have like maybe what three, a few minutes left, I may um, would like to re-ask the question from yesterday. But the um, the person's rebuttal from yesterday about the wine, why it, it, Jesus did not drink wine, uh -huh. he is saying uh, that the Bible verbatim did not say that Jesus did not put wine in, did not consume wine. He's saying that there is nowhere in Scripture where where, where that's a fair point that nowhere in Scripture it says and Jesus took the cup and drank the wine. Um, so I, I, I want to know how to rebut that. Um, okay, okay. the first thing to say is the fact that the Bible doesn't say that Jesus did or did not drink wine would, uh, would argue in, in favor that he did, because everyone did. I mean, in, in the Middle East, in ancient times, both in, Jew, in the Jews' customs and the Latin customs of the Romans and the Greek customs, we have writings. We have writings from people of those times that describe their customs. And all of those groups added wine to their water because the water was unsafe, just like it would be something you, you if you go to a third world country, you might try to uh, you know drink bottled water because you realize you can get some dysentery or something from drinking the local water. Uh, this was the case. And in the ancient world, they all knew it. Uh, and so... Uh, we read, for example, in, I think, Seneca among the Romans and, and certain Greek writers uh, and then certain rabbis, too, of, of the Jews, all, all these groups, they would add maybe um, a quarter of their glass would be filled with wine and the rest would be water. And the wine would sanitize the water and make it safe. That's, that was at every table all the time, unless you were a Nazarite. Now, Timothy, I guess, wanted to try out being a Nazarite. Nazarites were not allowed to drink any wine. And, uh, and Timothy uh, got sick. And Paul wrote to him and said, Timothy, don't drink only water, but put a little wine in it for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. That's, I mean, that's why they put wine in their water, is to make it drinkable. Now, to say that Jesus didn't would be to, I mean, the burden of proof would be on that. I mean, he, he was a Jew. He took Passover. They drank, I mean, he, that particular Passover, it doesn't mention him drinking the cup, but he, was, he kept the Passover on a regular basis. And wine was part of that meal. I mean, to, to suggest he didn't drink wine, you've got to find special reasons to say that because in the absence of any information one way or the other, it's a given. He and everyone else drank wine. I'm not sure why anyone would say he didn't. And that's a fair, fair point. And what would you do if they were, to, if one were to say that John the Baptist uh, was a Nazarite? Would did he, he also not have uh, wine in his water? What would be a rebuttal right. for that? Uh, oh no, he was a Nazarite. Yeah, John the Baptist definitely was a Nazarite, and he didn't drink wine. He didn't put wine in his water. But remember, Jesus, uh, he he contrasted himself from John the Baptist in this very thing that's in Matthew point, yeah, eleven. Sure. In Matthew 11, he says in verse 18 and 19, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine. And they say he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors. So he's pointing out he drinks wine. John doesn't because John's a Nazarite. And they, and they, they think he's got a religious spirit because he didn't drink wine as a Nazarite. But Jesus said, I do drink wine. And now they call me a wine bibber. So, I mean, again... The burden of proof is 100% on the person who wants to argue that Jesus didn't drink wine. Everything in scripture and common sense would indicate that he did. Hey, thanks for your call. I'm out of time. You've been listening to The Narrow Path radio broadcast. Our website is The Narrow Path.
www.thepetsmedia.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow.